There we go. Hi, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi, everybody at the Elephant and Castle community. I am Nick from Retribe, joining you at a little bit later or later during the week than we thought. Um, as um, our guest on Tuesday was diagnosed with COVID and isn't feeling very well. So we're sending Helen all our best wishes. But gratefully, up to step at the plate is Umfan Bassi, who um, is a screenwriter and the co founder of Talent X. So, um, Umfan, I'm so glad that you could you could step in at this date and uh, and we could bring a Facebook Live to the community this week. Um, thanks for joining me. How are you doing? Thank you for having me. Um, I'm very well, thank you. How about you? I'm really good. Like I thought, like our ca our cameras were down a little bit, so they could just kind of see this bit a bit earlier. And I just thought, hey, we're twinning um, <laughs> with with our outfits today. Uh, I'm I'm really good. I've had a, a, a crazy week. Um, our oldest, our youngest has been home. He's now back at school, but he's been home for the last few days. Yeah. And my, my work schedule has been really knocked out of whack because um, it's different when you're looking after a child at home and trying to do some work. So yeah. I ended up just putting most of the work on hold and, um, and just played a lot of roadblocks with a very sick child. So, um, but I'm really good. Mpon, um, can you, uh, can you uh, introduce, um, you know yourself to the community uh, what you do as a screenwriter i know your 10 years plus experience as a screenwriter um and then how you kind of came around to form talent x okay um so hi everyone i'm fun bassi um i'm a screenwriter and also the co-founder um, of talent x africa um so i'll start with how i got into screenwriting which is very interesting um so i grew up mostly in my head, right? So after school, I'll be back home. And then my dad had a room <clears throat> that had a library full of books. So I used to travel the world with books, right? Um, I read a lot and through reading, I learned how to write, you know? So I'll just read everything really slowly, see how they were punctuated, how they were spelled, all of that, you know? So I was subconsciously, um, becoming a writer at a very young age, um, but I wanted to be an accountant, you know, so I went ahead and studied accounting up until uni. Um, and then it wasn't until after my youth service. So in Nigeria, we have um, a one year program after university where you have to serve the country. Um, it's like paramilitary, but it's, it's never that serious, you know, so for my youth service, um, I also taught, I taught business studies in junior secondary school. And I guess that was when my love for storytelling became imminent, you know, because I had to relate with the kids there in junior school, junior secondary school. I had to relate with them at a level they were willing to engage, right? Um, and so there was a lot of storytelling and all of that. Um, and then <laughs> interesting story I also had a brief stint with football but that's by the way um but then I I fell in love with storytelling because even subconsciously in university right when I'm bored um I'll doodle some drawings and just write basic ramblings you know nothing deep sometimes I could write about colors um write about my emotions but growing up I only wrote to express feelings right when i had pent up emotions or anger or whatever you know i just let it out in writing um and then interestingly enough one of my classmates who's now a singer a popular singer in nigeria um told me oh um so most of the time she would be beside me and then i'll just be showing her what i was writing and she advised me to publish it um then it was blog post i, I think owned by google i can't remember but I, I used to blog on blog posts, um, but it was mostly for my course mates, right? Because it had some limiting factors where before you could comment, you had to open a blog post account and all of that, you know? Um, but then after university, I then transitioned to WordPress. You know, WordPress was a bit more accessible. You could comment as guests, all of that. And that was when, I guess my writing went outside of my course mates, you know? And as a result of that, one day a Nigerian director tweeted that he needed writers. And it was amazing how 
a few people mentioned me on that tweet, you know, and I was wondering like, oh, wow, you know, so I reached out to the guy the first time he didn't really respond because he wanted scripts while I was writing prose, right, in WordPress. So he didn't, he didn't really answer, but I guess he didn't get who he wanted. So he tweeted it again a few days later, and then my name was still mentioned, you know. So when I engaged with him, he simply told me, you know what, turn this story, this pro story into a screenplay, right? Download this uh, app and then Google the screenwriting format and just format your prose into a script, you know? So I did that and I got the gig, um, but I also wrote about two episodes or so on the series, but it never got shot, right? But what that did for me was I now had two scripts I had written, whether or not they got shot, you know? So later, about two years later, um, that's when this satellite TV station, DSTV, they are very popular in Africa. Um, so they were hiring for one of their sitcoms, the Johnsons. Um, so the call went out and the entry criteria was pretty simple, you know, just show us what you've written. You know, and I had these two scripts I had written that never got shot. So I entered them for two uh, jobs as I then, two series, and I got the jobs, right? I even had to um, more or less tell the bigger one because I had related with the smaller one a lot earlier and started work on that. So I had to tell the Johnsons to give me a few months to, to finish that commitment. And that's how my screenwriting career began, right? Um, and this story would also then tie into how Talent X came about, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So because I'm a screenwriter and that's the foundation of every uh, play or every movie that comes on screen, there has to be a script, right? Um, and it seems like most screenwriters write in isolation, you know? So even now, um, I have a lot of drafts on my computer, they're just there, right? Um, but I know that a lot of screenwriters also face that issue where they write scripts for producers, sometimes well-meaning producers, you know, but the issue is just, there's just no fund to make that film, right? To, to get it across to screen, um, which is one of the issues I faced pretty earlier on, you know, writing a screenplay and I didn't get to see it on screen because there wasn't funding. You know, but luckily enough for me, I got other gigs that were properly funded and I got to see see them on screen. Um, and, you know, in the course of my career, I have also because, like I said, I grew up mostly in my head, you know, so I work comfortably on my own in my house, in my room. Um, but there were then slight disparities in what I was writing and what I was seeing on screen, you know, and then I'd complain to the head writer like, oh, they took out this scene. Oh, I really love this action. It wasn't there, you know, and then he told me very simply, like, okay, you'd write what you have to write, hand it over to production, and what they do with it is their business, mm -hmm. right? your mm -hmm. operation has ended, you know, but I was coming from a pretty imaginative place where I really wanted what I imagined to come on screen that way, you know, not factoring that I was probably giving production some problems, you know, yeah. writing in things they couldn't execute, you know. Yeah. So I then took a little break from writing to check out production. I even started from the bottom in production, you know. So I started out as a production assistant. Mm -hmm. It was pretty much the hands guy, you know, any department that needs help, they will call on you. You know, and as I, when I did this, I was writing for arguably the biggest sitcom in Africa, you know, but I had to let that go and go and see the next phase of, you know, the value chain. Mm -hmm. You start from the very bottom, carry lighting equipment, help the makeup department carry their bag, whatever it was they needed. I even learned how to use the clapper board, you know, yes, <laughs> and all yes, of that, <laughs> you know. So yeah. um, that, that was pretty much my journey into um, screenwriting and production. Um, yeah. And then in 2020, um, that's when 
we pretty much thought we needed to so the main motivation initially for talent x was just changing the narrative you know of african stories wanting to take charge of our stories you know tell african stories by africans um then to africans and the rest of the world but keeping that authenticity in our stories how they're being narrated to the world because there were a lot of negative they probably still are a lot of negative stereotypes about Africa, about African people, where, you know, if you want to talk about Africa, all you're thinking of is the safari, um, animals, wild animals, you know, huts. Um, and so we thought of changing that narrative, right? But then problems uh, surfaced where I sort of immediately got an epiphany of my very first problem in screenwriting, which was funding right mm -hmm. um so yes you want to tell african stories you want to tell them there are various forms of telling stories you know but in filmmaking this time filmmaking is a very expensive um, medium of telling stories you know so we were immediately faced with the problem of funding so people have stories to tell probably have typed them out but they will not make it to screen because it costs a lot of money that they don't have access to you know mm -hmm. so it immediately became um, a call to action, you know, in us wanting to change the narrative, tell authentic African stories, we had to then think of how to solve um, for the funding problem, right? Um, and in thinking of that, we also figured, you know, funding and monetization are tied together. You know, those, it became twin problems to solve for, you know, because mm -hmm. to get funding from anyone um, who has value for their money, they want to know how the money is coming back, right? Um, and that brought us to identifying two main problems in the Nigerian um, film industry and probably the African film industry at large, right? Which was funding problem and monetization problems, you know? Um, and so that became our primary, um, what's it called now? Um, focus for Talent X, coming up with funding that are tailored for creatives, right? Because mm -hmm. we found out um, after a bit of research that the funding outlets available to Nigerian creatives or Nigerian filmmakers were personal funding, funding from family and friends, um, crowdfunding, and then maybe bank loans. But yeah. bank loans are the hardest to get right because to secure a bank loan in nigeria you need hard collateral of about 100 to 150 percent of the value you're trying to get which mm. if you think about it makes no sense if i have an asset worth the budget of my film why not just why, why, do, you need, why do you need a loan yeah <laughs> why not just sell the asset and you know convert that money rather than pay you the asset as collateral to get the loan and yeah. then maybe i'm even trying to you know service the loan and for some reason i can't fully service it and now i've also lost the asset you know mm -hmm. uh, so it became obvious that those types of loans were not tailored for creatives you know and aside from even the hard collateral the loan tenor um and how much leeway you're giving the creative because let's not forget i'm privileged to be able to think from an accounting side and a creative side because I have an accounting degree and mm. I have creative experiences, you know, but most creatives don't care about that. They just want to create, right? And most finance people don't also get the creative process. They just want to give you money and know when it's coming back, you know? Mm. So Talent X had to find a way to bridge that gap. Um, our team is made up of magnificent teams of creatives, finance people and um, tech people, right? Because we essentially figured the best way to solve for this problem will be using tech. You know, tech is scalable. Um, we can just manufacture systems that work and then, you know, it, it becomes something that can become uh, an adoptable infrastructure, right? Yeah. Um, so what we did was we teamed up with finance um, partners that had, in. Uh, what's it called now, they had expressed interest in investing in the creative space, 
you know, but they didn't know how to, they didn't know how things worked, you know. And then from talking to the financiers, we also figured out another problem from that side, which is the risk of non-completion, right? Mm. So we have funded your project, but at the end of the day, there's actually nothing to hold on to because you didn't complete it, mm. right? So we then had to think of how to cater for all of those three things, which is creative funding, completing the project, and getting the financiers back their money. You yeah. know? Um, so as a result of that, we started playing more like um, what we call collateral managers, right? And the beauty of this is we were able to convince these financiers to accept the intellectual property of those projects as collateral, right? As opposed to hard assets. You know, so that automatically makes it a little more accessible to creatives. Just in this instance, now we have to deal with creatives that we know are viable, creatives that mm -hmm. know what they're doing, you know, have stories that we know the world wants to hear or watch, you know, stories that we know can be shot for a reasonable amount that can be gotten back, you know, as opposed to um, perhaps maybe making a film for a million dollars. You know, what are the chances of you getting that money back? You know, so we also had to, within ourselves, figure out what the sweet spot was for projects. You know, something that would tell a compelling story, not take away from the creativity, you know, and pay everyone a fair wage, you know, for their labor, you know, because also in the space of working in the uh, production space, starting from the bottom and, you know, not going, oh, do you know who I am and all of that, just humbly taking humble it. beginnings yeah exactly yeah. you know i got to see how people are treated yeah that's you know concerning their wages i worked on a number of things i didn't get paid for you know i worked on a number of things i had to use my money to cater yeah. for my welfare for and those things are not they're not meant to be so right so that's, how, I think I, I think that's one of the most unfair things in the in the film industry is okay. any anybody like any young creative and I worked in TV for a long time and uh, at a very big network in in London and um, you know even there the amount of interns that people were people were like they they might pay some travel expenses and we're talking like we're talking about you know one of the biggest sports broadcasters on the planet and they would still be taking free labor on these internships. Exactly. Um, and you're, you know, and it's, it's taking, and I think that is the, you know, that, that creative industry, TV, film, everyone wants, to, so many people want to get into it, but it's the entry level positions that are, it's so hard where these amazing young, talented people are, are exist, but there's no, and especially with the cost of living, you know, there's, there's, there's no kind of entry level for them. And so that's what I, I love what, what you're doing and that you're trying to tackle those problems. Mm -hmm. And as you were speaking to Mfon, like right at the beginning, when you were talk, talking your story about you know, traveling and reading. I, I I just go back to me as a child, and the the struggles that I had reading, and and how there was only a couple of books could really pull me in because I was very visual in my brain, and I wasn't a very good reader because I had problems with my eyes, so I could only read one word at a time, and I actually I got picked on in in school, and it, and a teacher would make fun of me in the in the class. And that really sent me into a, a space of like, I do not want to read, but I had no outlet for this kind of these ideas and these like living in pictures in my head. And, and, and I'm, I'm really interested to know more about the guy who kind of told you to get the app and to that, that kind of shove to start writing a screenplay. Well, when I was 16, I remember I, I was quite a charmer at school because I, I could, I could charm my teachers and saying, you know, I, I had sports last night, so I couldn't quite do the homework. <laughs> and he pulled he, he pulled me aside one day and he sick, said nick he goes in a nutshell he said do you want to be a charmer all your life and just kind of eat your way through or do you want to sh kind of show some of the talent that i've seen in you because i i've seen that you do have a creative eye and you're I, I so he got me into writing poetry because it it wasn't hard for me to write small sentences and and you know not worrying about anything it was just a prose it was just a bit you know how i like watching a train Kind of going by in the prairies and just writing about how the sun would break between the cars and um and I, it was just a huge build of self-esteem for me for him to pick up say nick can you come and read this in front of the class and my so this man 
really nurtured a, a really a, a, a traumatized child because I had other things going on in my life too that were, made me quite a scared child. Um, so I, I really like as you were as you're talking about your traveling and you had books. It almost it was a very romantic image for me, you know. So could you get like what was it like? And and then I want to kind of reflect on today's youth and how you know do they have the, the the that ability to 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 get pulled into a book because of these things they they can get pulled <laughs> pulled into far far easier. And I'm not saying these are bad, yeah. but you know they they definitely do take place of what a book can take can can easily do um so talk more about your your experience as a young man young child growing up with books and what they did to you um and how they made you feel okay um so for me i guess you misunderstood when i said travel right it okay literally me traveling with books but me traveling through books right oh okay yeah yeah took me to places I wanted to be, places I had imagined, you know, helped me imagine places, right? So books didn't make me feel like I was just in the room, the third room in the house that was actually a library, you know, with the books. I remember just like you said, I always struggled with too many words, you know, it, it could be discouraging to me. So most of the books I read had some sorts of illustrations. You know, I remember, and it blighted, for example, Famous Five. I read a lot of those books that were illustrated, you know, and it also helped that they were adventurous books. So it helped me feel adventurous. It helped me feel like the sixth person of that group, you know, going on adventures with them, right? Um, and that goes without saying that I'm a visual person. So as soon as I was introduced to videos, that immediately became my new medium, right? So right now I struggle a lot with reading, which is a terrible thing to say as a writer, <laughs> right? Um, but I, I, I think I get things easier when I see them, right? See them play out than when I have to read them, you know, which was also a little issue I had with the Nigerian educational system where it was mostly theory and not enough practicals, you know, I felt like I'll get this thing if it demonstrated it, other than making me read it out of a book. Now it's just words I probably have to cram and, you know, put down in an exam. I don't really understand it. You know, I'm really just understanding a lot of things I read in the past now from experiencing them, right? Which will have been an easier way for me to understand them then, right? And I keep telling people um, that I learned a lot of things by watching, for example, driving, right? By watching my dad. Um, so when I'm on holidays, he would drive with me to work and I'll just watch him and be like, what did you just do? What does that do? And that's how I learned how to drive. You know, so me getting behind the steering for the first time, I pretty much knew what to do from watching, right? And a host of other things, some artistic stuff too. I just watched someone do it and I'm like, okay, I can do this too. And I went ahead to do it, you know? Um, so I'm a visual person, which made me want to cater to people like me, right? Mm -hmm. So in my motivation for telling stories, most of the time, it has educational components in it more than entertainment, right? I try to find that fine balance where I'm entertaining those that want to be entertained and those that came here to learn will have something to take away from this, right? Because that was me learning from what I watch things, right? Okay. So even from films, I, <laughs> I prefer real stories to fantasy and sci-fi, right? Because I want to learn about new places. I want to be like, oh, that happens there. That's awesome, or that's terrible. You know, I want to learn from watching stuff, which was my motivation, my personal motivation. And I was lucky enough to find like minds in my team. Um, for wanting to change that African narrative. Like Africa is more than what the Western media shows, right? For example, even just saying Africa, you know, it's like, okay, we're in Africa, right? <laughs> there is Western Africa that has a lot of countries. There's Southern Africa, there's Eastern Africa, there's Northern Africa, right? So when you even say, when you generalize and you say Africa, I'm like, we're in Africa, right? 
Nigeria, there's Benin Republic, there's Togo, there's Ghana, there's Cameroon. You know, there are a lot of, and even though we have basic similarities, there are also a lot of obvious differences, right? Um, so yes, to be able to tell stories that are set in, say, Nigeria and about Nigerian people, their arts, their culture, their trials, their tribulations about Ghanaian people, you know, what's so great about them, you know, what are the things they wish they could change, just tell true stories and educate someone that once had the notion of, oh, Africa, jungle, right? And now you have to watch these African stories and you're like, oh, they have cars, oh, they have high rise buildings, oh, they speak good English, you know, just being able to show you true pictures. That's my motivation for storytelling. It doesn't always have to be rosy. I mean, um, even <laughs> to my writing team, most of the time when I write, we have those arguments where I'm always clamoring for like a sad ending because I'm like, life is a tragedy. I don't believe in happy endings, you know, but I mean, life doesn't always have to be a tragedy. You know, there are happy endings, you know, but I just believe some stories too, you have to know this doesn't end happily for anyone involved, right? Mm -hmm. So being able to tell true stories um, is, is my main motivation. And then I'll touch on um, the guy that made me write screenplays. Um, that was a huge blessing for me because um, it really guided me to where I wanted to be but didn't really know, right? Because at first I was writing just to express myself, to you know, pour out emotions and not implode, right? And then being a teacher for one year, I saw the need to tie in storytelling into education, right? But I still hadn't really figured out what that medium was until when someone suggested screenplay. And it really spoke to me in a marvelous way where it's like, I can really, really express myself through this medium. I can write action. I can write dialogue. I can build characters, you know, and also, I mean, it goes without saying, if I say I live in my head that I'm an observant person, right? So I can walk into a gathering and not say anything. And I'm really just observing everyone, right? Um, most of the time, just knowing who I really want to interact with here, right? I, <laughs> just trying to gauge exactly who I'm interested in talking to, who I think, nah, this person might be too much trouble, right? So as a result of that, I have so much characters in my head, you know? So being able to put those characters in situations that entertain and educate was a blessing, you know? So, um, but unfortunately I won't be mentioning who this person's name is because they also were part of the people that taught me vital lessons about what not to do mm. so i wasn't treated well i didn't get paid for those scripts um and then i got called <clears throat> to write about two more scripts i didn't get paid for this time got shot i mean the excuse for the first one was it wasn't shot and i was naive so i didn't know i shouldn't care about that i have provided a service pay me what you do with it is your business right um but what really struck me was when he eventually did shoot one, um, claimed he rewrote it, even though it was the same thing I wrote, and mm -hmm. I actually did watch it, and I didn't get paid for it, you know? So that taught me, you know, there needs to be protection of screenwriters. Mm -hmm. So as a result of that, the first people we engaged with, because let's not forget, I said we started operation in 2020, January 2020, and then the pandemic hit in March, you know? So we're going to take, a more, um, how do I put it now, silent approach in the beginning. We're going to do a lot more research to think of who are the best people to work with, work with them, and then start coming out when those projects were ready. You know, but we didn't have the luxury of that when the pandemic hit. We had to do something for the industry we care about. You know, so we then thought of who could work with all the restrictions and that automatically became the screenwriters you know you can work mm -hmm. off out of your home and because of how the nigerian economy is a lot of people wear multiple caps so we then targeted those that were writer producers 
right? So you can write your script and you can start compiling your team in your head, all of that before we are cleared to go on set, right? Um, so we called for entry, we called it the Talent Creative Solidarity Fund. Um, so we called for entries, we had over a hundred entries um, where we asked people to just pitch stories, right? And you could pitch multiple stories. Um, we asked for the log lines, the synopsis, and then like a three page treatment to just get an idea of what's the story you're trying to tell. No limitations on genre, nothing. Just tell us a story, you know? And we knew within ourselves, we we're going to try to pick authentically African stories, stories that spoke through to Africa. Um, because um, part of some issues that we also faced was emulation, right? Where, um, I don't want to say Nigerians, you know, but where Africans probably think the, um, the rave is foreign stories or you're trying to fit in African characters into foreign situations like we see in blockbuster movies, you know? So, we wanted to tell stories that have not been told before mm -hmm. that are not really interested in telling you know but we know people need to watch so um we shortlisted 10 um no we shortlisted four out of those hundred and something and then we paid them to write scripts out of those stories right and we were going to then choose two to fund their films right that you know, came about from their screenplays. Um, so we did that and we had so much problems choosing two out of four because they were awesome, right? Wow. They were awesome. And then we even did more work because I'm a screenwriter. So my focus is always on the story, the story first. I believe you are not likely to make a terrible film out of a great script but it's very difficult to make a great film out of a terrible script. Yeah. So the first drafts were great. We organized workshops free, you know, where we had um, a top screenwriter in Nigeria and a Nigerian screenwriting lecturer in the States. Take them on, I think it was three weeks workshop, you know, with the aim of working on the next draft being better, right? So we did that. And we were able to come up with the two winners, you know, to fund. Um, but like I said, the funding is not a grant, it's a loan, as gotten from the creative, uh, the financing partners, you know, so it's a loan with interest. But how it works is they give a moratorium period, which is usually a little over a year, where they are catering for the fact that you will be working on the project in that time, right? So interest might be accurate, but repayment is not due. Mm -hmm. And the obligation of the filmmaker ends when, I mean, legally speaking, ends when they deliver the project, right? Which means in the off chance that all the checks and balances we put in place don't work out, they give us a finished project and we are unable to monetize it. It's not a personal debt. So mm -hmm. no one will come to knock on your door, Nick, and say you owe us 500,000. No, right? You use the 500,000 to make a film. This is the film, right? So mm -hmm. all you will let go of as Nick is your, uh, what's it called? Your stake in the intellectual property of the film. Saying, you know what? Yeah, I, I give you the project to do as you want with. That's your 500,000 there, mm -hmm. you know? So that's what we worked on as an infrastructure for creatives, where creatives can just worry about being creative. Just soak yourself in the creative process with our guardians, with the story, with your, uh, what's it called, implementation team, your production team. Those are the things we just check because we are collateral managers. We need to mitigate against risk, right? Mm -hmm. So first risk is the story. We went through with that, making sure they had as much guardians as possible to come up with great stories. Each of those stories had at least six drafts, right? which says a lot for the Nigerian film industry, right? I don't know if you know, but the Nigerian film industry is the second largest in terms of output in the world. Mm. Right? We turn in a lot of films, right? Which then suggests that there might not be a lot of quality control on some levels, you know, but we put in place 
infrastructure that makes sure that from the very beginning, we are mitigating against risk of non-payment in making sure the story is great, the screenplay is great, the team behind executing that are competent. And then once we have all of that, we're very likely going to come up with a project that we can then monetize. Um, yeah. yeah, that's that's how we work, basically. It's beautiful. I'm thinking, um, I want to ask you about the Johnsons. <laughs> you mentioned, I want to ask what that is. Um, but also, we'll maybe we'll get that, that you can, but I'm interested like now today in the world of TikTok yeah. and that you got a lot of people that are putting all their creativity uh, as an individual into their phone, creating these kind of little nugget sized films. How, like with tradition of filmmaking and um, storytelling that's kind of deep rooted in the TV and film industry, how do you kind of embrace the new new thoughts and ideas, much like how medicine evolves, right? Like, you know, doctors are constantly being taught new things. I don't, I don't hear a lot of that in the film industry. I still kind of, whenever I picture a film set, it's very much the way it was 20 or 30 years ago. How, like, like how, especially with youngsters, and I know you like, um, like how to express creativity, but how do we start to kind of mesh things together in terms of new technologies and even new formats, you know, because I think that everyone thinks about a, a half hour show being 22 or 24 minutes or an hour show being, you know, 48 minutes or 52 minutes and creating those kind of, it's got to fit in these little things for commercials where, you know, we've got so much more freedom today in the internet and the use of like, you know, the, all the channels out there. So like, is it something that you're very conscious of? How do you nurture it in, in young people? Okay, um, definitely. So I'll start by saying, I think, those short forms are very brilliant. If you can tell a story in a short time and people mm. understand it, people relate to it, I think you're a very brilliant storyteller. Mm. So, um, and also as a result of that, like you rightfully said, our attention span these days are very short, you know, because we, <laughs> we have our phones and you in 30 minutes, you can go through 30, uh 30 expressions mm. full from start to end you know you're laughing 30 times you're sharing 30 times um and so remember i said we're solving for problems using tech um so one of our tech products that will be released soon is called grid g-r-i-d um and it's a monetization platform right because for um funding <laughs> there needs to be monetization. So what Grid is, is, is a free to host platform where you can host your content, right? And the main motivation for that was monetization for short films, because one of the four, um, four uh, finalists of the TCSF of 2020 was a short film. And one of the few things that counted against it was monetization, right? As at then, we couldn't chat how it was going to make money because most short films in Nigeria by Nigerians are proof of concepts. You know, you shoot a short film, you send it to film festivals just to show your proficiency as a filmmaker. You're not likely going to make money on that piece, right? Uh, but for Grid, we're making it free to host. Um, it can go across other medium or other media, right? So short film, feature film, music, poetry, prose, anything that doesn't involve as at now, deliver, uh, logistics of delivery, right? Digital formats, you can host it on grid, um, free. You can, you're also in charge of your pricing. So for example, Nick, you have the Retribe um, community that you believe so much in um, and you believe they will support you financially, right? So it's left to you to determine what that price point is that your community can show that one and two also left to you to bring your community onto grid to pay for your services right so for example this talk you feel you can monetize it you put it on grid uh you make it 50 pence or 50p to what's it called to view right and then you share that grid link to your retribe and tell them guys please watch please support every single sale you make you get to keep 90% off. So grid only takes 10% per sale. And that's the only point 
were taking money after a successful sale, right? So that's what greed is meant to be. And I think that will cater mostly for short form content, right? Where the monetization is usually in the hand of the platform, you know? So for example, um, for YouTube, there are certain metrics you need to cross to be monetizable. You need to have clocked in certain viewing hours. You need to have certain amount of subscribers at the end of which YouTube probably then pays you one cent of every dollar you make, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's for YouTube. For, for example, again, for Netflix, they do mostly licensing deals. So Netflix might license your film for $200,000 exclusively for three years. And that's all they give you. You don't know how much they make off that, but if you know, you know how capitalism works, you can guess they're making times 10 in the very least, right? But in this instance, there's a platform for you to host your stuff freely. And let's not also forget only YouTube out of these two examples can you upload. For Netflix, you need to reach out to them. They need to agree to put it on their platform, right? But with this, there's a platform where you can host your stuff, set pricing, and then get your crowd to come and pay for it. And you get your money up to 90%, right? So that's what we're trying to do to solve for that, where, okay, you like short form content, cool. Make it, host it on grid, get people to pay for it and get your money, as opposed to perhaps cloud chasing now, right? Which is, you're trying to get your numbers up to be monetizable. You know, in this instance, maybe you have a huge following on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, get them, to come and pay for your stuff on grid, you know? Um, so that's our first attempt at solving for that. Um, we're also trying to host um, a cohort of, I like to call it a mini incubator, right? Where we're trying to help um, young filmmakers in a crash course in filmmaking, at the end of which they would pitch to us short films that we would choose one to fund. You know, so we're also then trying to actively encourage the making of short form content too, you know, in as much as our main um, focus is the feature films, but we are not neglecting the short form, you know, with the hope that by the time that project is done, you know, grid will be fully functional and that would be a viable option for that film to go on for the filmmaker to then monetize as opposed to have it just as um, a proof of concept. So I, I hope that answers your question. I'm muted. Okay. Yeah, I just yeah. muted myself. But, um, but yeah, no, I'm going to check out Grid. But we're running out of time. Tell me what Johnson's, the Johnson's is about. Um, it's a family sitcom, you know, yeah. about, uh, a young boy. So he's actually a very old man, not very old, but he's an old man. Um, but he came to fame in the Nigerian film industry with a fellow small man, you know, so it looks like kids, but they're adults. So they were able to act very well as mischievous kids, you know. Mm. So one of those became the star of the Johnsons, where he's the older son, right? He only has a senior sister. He has two younger ones that are taller than him, you know. And so there's a lot of comedy that ensures or comes from that situation. You know, he's also brilliant. He wants to be a scientist like his dad. His dad is also like a serial field scientist. You know, so there's a lot of drama. His mom, the actress actually died sometime this year. Um, God rest her soul. Um, but the mom then was uneducated. So imagine an overly educated father who's a failed scientist. He's a civil servant, but he keeps thinking he'll make it big as a scientist. An uneducated mom um, that has to deal with four children. She's a full housewife. Then the sister is done with uni. Or no, she was attempting to get in uni. So there was a bit of comedy in her attempt to mm -hmm. fit the entrance exams and having to deal with a younger brother who is brilliant, you know, um, but has bullies in school and then has two younger ones. If the last born, the girl who's daddy's angel, daddy's princess, very sport, gets her way. And then the third born who more or less has the middle child syndrome, even though he's technically not. So, he wants to be a fashion designer. He thinks 
he has swag, all of that, you know, and all the drama that ensues, you know, but that sitcom is actually over a decade old now. I mean, I stopped writing for them in 2020, but now where they are at is the daughter is married with her own family. The man is a successful scientist, businessman. The middle child is now a fashion designer, you know. They all had to struggle to get to this point. Um, but that's where the series is now. I want to, you're going to have to send me some links. I want to watch a few episodes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll, I'll send you, um, I think I have Showmax subscription. So I'll, okay. I'll just send you my login so you can. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Mpa, do you know what? Like we ran out of time. Yeah. But I'm wondering, this is going to, I'm just going to throw it out to you really quickly. I mm-hmm. wonder whether or not you consider, or we could put together some, a workshop for some, some children, some young adults, young some teenage people in the Elephant and Castle area. Maybe we could do a little screenwriting workshop because I know there's a lot of people in this community that they, they just want access to doing some cool things mm-hmm. that could develop into a professional career. Um, so we'll talk about it offline, but I'm going to plant the seed with you now so you can't yeah, yeah. see I'm, it. I'm always Everyone's open. seeing it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always open to that, and I'm sure my people will like that too. So yes, yes, let's talk yeah. about it. Uh, love it. Mufan, thank you so much for, for joining me today. I've put all the links in in uh, in the Facebook feed. Okay. Um, but it, but if you have a final kind of, if anyone needs to get in touch with you, um, is it all through those links or are there other ways to get in touch with you? Um, so they can either reach out through the company link or my personal links, right? Um, okay. So my Instagram and my Twitter, uh, Mufan Obasi. Can I type that in the chat? Do you know- if you go to the, the where this is or just send it to me and I'll put it in. Okay, okay, yeah. So I'll send you my personal details too and uh, yep. you can reach yep. out personally or to the company. Dude, you're an awesome man. I love what you're doing. I'm so grateful that we got to meet and I hope we can maybe put some a, a little kind of workshop on uh, in the community because I think people would really love it. So um, let's, let's talk about that offline and I'm going to say goodbye to everybody now. Don't forget you can join me next Tuesday at 11 a.m. Uh, for another amazing guest. Uh, Mfon, thank you for joining me. And for, for now, for everybody, see you later.